Thank you, everybody. As usual, for people in the back, there are plenty of seats down front, so uh, don't be bashful. We, we won't call on you very much if you come down in the front. It'll be okay. Uh, thank you all. Welcome. We are delighted to have you with us as we look out and see a lot of familiar faces and uh, people new to us, so thank you all for, for being here. Um, both you here in the auditorium as well as those who are joining us via the live stream and the internet. And by the way, this uh, symposium will be archived on our website, curals.org, beginning sometime tomorrow. So um, you don't have to worry about taking copious notes. You can go back and check the symposium uh, beginning tomorrow. So I have a few uh, administrative notes. One is the usual, please turn off your cell phones and other electronic devices so that you don't intrude upon your neighbor's enjoyment of the program. Thank you very much. Immediately following the panel discussion, we'll have a reception upstairs for everybody, and you are cordially invited to join us to uh, meet and talk with the researchers, members of our board and staff and each other, and uh, exchange information about what you've learned here today. We also want to certainly thank the people here at the Joseph B. Martin Conference Center who've just done such a wonderful job at facilitating this and helping us make a, uh, this a great event. Uh, you know, it's great to get together and share this fellowship and also uh, learn much more about the research that is uh, hastening the end to this terrible disease. Um, a few years ago, now more than a few years ago, uh, almost 15 years ago, two people, among many, but two in particular, saw the need for much more aggressive, innovative, uh, impatient research to end Alzheimer's disease. This was Jeff and Jackie Morby who started the foundation that has become Cure Alzheimer's Fund. And they gathered up a few other like-minded, impatient people to found that foundation. Uh, and here we are today, almost 15 years later. So it's my great pleasure to introduce to you the co-founder and co-chair of Cure Alzheimer's Fund, Jeff Morby. Thank you, Till. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Several days ago, we were advised that the, uh, the Charity Navigator, one of the largest uh, evaluators of uh, foundations, had picked the Cure Alzheimer's Fund as one of the top 10 medical research organizations in their database. Uh, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> because 15 years ago, Cure Alzheimer's did not exist. So in a 15 year period, we've been able to build this organization to the point we've qualified for this recognition. Uh, the, uh, the cause of this, I th think, superior performance has been really helped by four or five basic categories of people. Um, First of all, and most important, our scientists, uh, Rudy Tanzi and as head of our research group, and then we have now 90 world-class scientists working on Alzheimer's disease from all over the world. Uh, secondly, and very importantly, uh, the directors of Cure Alzheimer's Fund, and I'll read you their names. There's Bill Benter, a new director, Bob Greenhill, Jay Jester, Phyllis Rappaport, Sherry Sharp, and my wife, Jackie Morby, along with Tim Armour and, most importantly, Henry McCanns, who's my co-chairman. 
Uh, these people, uh, since inception, have funded all the operating costs of the Cure Alzheimer's Fund for 15 years so that any uh, donations by third parties will go directly into, 100% into research. Uh, this has been a tremendous support and a driving force behind the organization. The third area uh, of great importance has been our staff. We have a wonderful staff. Uh, they're highly motivated. They're motivated by our one objective, which is to find a cure for Alzheimer's disease. And they are tremendous. And heading this staff from the very inception has been Tim Armour. He's been fabulous. <laughs> now, <clears throat> Jack and I and the uh, initial founders, which was uh, Phyllis and Henry and Jackie and I, just want to thank all these groups that I just mentioned for their tremendous support over the last 15 years. We very, very much appreciate it. Finally, the key to our success has been the people who are funding us. And uh, this year, um, with our anticipated receipts from um, donations, we expect to fund, at least have funded over the last years, $90 million of research for Alzheimer's, which is pretty amazing. <laughs> and uh, so thank all, all of you for your support of this cause. <clears throat> now, usually I comment a little bit more than I'm planning to on our science, but I, just let me say that we've continued to move the ball forward in a tremendous way. We uh, are continuing to be the leaders in the genomics of Alzheimer's. Uh, we continue to uh, develop more thoroughly the concept the antimicrobial uh, anti uh, function of amyloid and how it acts as a protection but also uh, is a causal agent for Alzheimer's. And we're now in the process of using Alzheimer's in the dish, which is a new tool developed by the Cure Alzheimer's Fund, Rudy and his team, to analyze the growth of neurons in a mini brain and see how they develop Alzheimer's pathology and also to show how we can uh, introduce medicines in, into that mini brain and uh, reduce the uh, pathology. And we now are in the process of doing a high throughput program in which we're analyzing all uh, major uh, drugs on the marketplace to see if any of them can be repurposed uh, for Alzheimer's drugs. And I'm sure Rudy is going to talk to you about that. Uh, finally, um, this, this, uh, this uh, conference is a little ex an experiment. Um, in the past, Rudy has been the dominant figure, and this year we're going to show you a few of our other wonderful scientists. So, Rudy, uh, would you come up and introduce our great speakers? Thank you. Well, thank you, Jeff. And um, it's just so great to come here. And I, I was able to have a gin and tonic because I don't have to speak. <laughs> but don't, don't worry, they didn't kick me out yet. No, I'm only kidding. Um, things have never been better um, in terms of research. I always tell Henry, and I wrote in my first book 20 years ago, that our research luck in my lab has always matched the Red Sox. <laughs> and this year, I'm exhausted, because too, you know, when, when things don't work in a lab, it's easy. 
right? You just think, what are you going to do next? When things work, uh, you have to do a lot more uh, work. And uh, this year, with 100, 107 wins under their belt, you know, and my lab had papers in nature, neuroscience, science, neuron, just, and it's still going this year. Uh, it never been more true that the Red Sox kind of dictate the progress. And now it's spilling over into all of Cure Alzheimer's Fund because all of our investigators, and you'll hear tonight from three of the best in the world, um, and it's a perfect combination of, of folks you're going to hear from tonight. I'll tell you why uh, in a moment. But you're going to hear uh, just how great things are going in this field. And I think that one of the themes you're going to hear tonight will be something that we first started talking about 14 years ago when I first met with, the, with our founders, with the, with the Morbys and Henry and Phyllis, about the genetics were, were spelling out what's happening in this disease. And, and first, everything pointed to amyloid. And then we realized, well, hitting amyloid in patients with this disease might be a little too late. You have to hit it early. And we have Ron Peterson here who's championing, championing for us uh, with the FDA ways to do the right types of trials, hitting amyloid at the right time 10 years before uh, 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 symptoms. Uh, we have Bob Vassar, my good, uh, and all these guys, and Bob and Ron and Teresa are not just colleagues, but they're really dear friends as well, so it's great to see you here. Uh, Ron is uh, from Minnesota, so the twins, we won't talk about the twins. Um, we're going to spare him that. <laughs> uh, but you're in second place, you know, that's good in that, lead, that division. I'll, I'll go easy. Um, and, and uh, you know, Bob Vassar discovered beta secretase. Beta secretase is one of the most promising targets for you know, hitting amyloid early on with a little white pill rather than having to use an antibody or immunotherapy that carries you know, more complexity. So um, Bob's a, a, a legend in, in, in the field for his uh, discoveries and um, doing great work. And many of you always hear me, every time I speak, you've heard me talk about resilience, right? That you can live with a brain full of plaques and tangles, and as long as you don't have neuroinflammation, then you could probably last a long time without dementia and that this is our real target for patients who are suffering hit neuroinflammation. Well, I always talk about it, but the person who actually discovered that is Teresa Gomez Isla, who's a, my real hero because she discovered that and I talk about it all the time. And much of our work is targeting the neuroinflammation because that's how we can help patients right now is turn off those bad events. So you got a stellar crew here um, on this panel. I can't wait to, to hear them. So I'm gonna shut up really soon. But when I first met um, on the founders, you know, we talked about how we got to Alzheimer's. And, you know, I got to Alzheimer's through the back door. I was studying Down syndrome. And Down syndrome pe folks grow up to get Alzheimer's pathology inevitably. And that's when it gave me an idea for where the first Alzheimer's gene might be. And that all worked out well back when I was a student here. And at that time, that's why I took this auditorium is named after Joseph B. Martin, who was the dean. And I have to say, um, and if it wasn't for Joe Martin, I wouldn't be here. Um, he was the last author of my first paper in Nature with Jim Gasella finding the Huntington's gene. Um, supported me all the way through from student to professor. He was the one who gave me the Kennedy Endowed Chair. In fact, I was sitting where Teresa's sitting and I was about to go up and give a talk. And he whispered over to me, oh, by the way, uh, the Kennedy Chair is becoming available. I'm going to give it to you uh, next. And then I had to go up and give a talk and I was, I, I, I didn't even, I don't even know what I said for an hour because I, I couldn't believe it. But anyway, this is, Joe Martin is an amazing guy and we owe him a lot. And uh, this is just uh, a great, great uh, uh, venue for this uh, event. Now, it's amazing how far we, we, we've come. You know, this, this Cure Alzheimer's Fund, I tell people, if you, if you want to fund research and you want to give dollars for research, high impact research, there's no other game in town than Cure Alzheimer's Fund. They've given out $75 million. I got notes here that, that Tim gave me. Thank you, Tim. Um, 340 projects, 70 researchers, um, and just amazing impact. The thing about Cure Alzheimer's Fund is that the papers we publish end up in very high impact journals. They're paradigm changing. We, we were the first to find the gene involved with inflammation in the disease in 2008. Um, uh, I, I could go through so many discoveries, but, but paradigms change in this field largely due to the work of Cure Alzheimer's Fund, and it's continuing even more. And Henry, if the Red Sox, when the Red Sox, I won't say when, I'll say if, uh, when, I won't give it bad luck, win the World Series, I don't know what's going to happen. Maybe we'll have a chance to cure this, this disease once and for all. Um, but it's just been a great run. We have a great research leadership group, um, uh, 29 great investigators. Um, and the main thing about the way we do things, and this is the mandate of our board, 
and facilitated by Meg Smith, who's just amazing at, at negotiating the science with us. Tim Armour, who, who um, I have a poster of Tim Armour in my bedroom because, you know, he's my hero. And um, no, I don't really, Tim. I'm that, that would just be, that would just be awkward. Um, <laughs> But but, um, <laughs> but 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 seriously, um, uh, uh, the way the way things are going, um, uh, I have uh, such great um, optimism about about uh, where we're going with this uh, uh, disease. Um, so I'm going to just um, uh, shut up, and uh, I get a chance to just sit back and listen this year, which is great. But you haven't escaped me because yesterday, I shot two hours of video, uh, updating everything we know about Alzheimer's from around our, uh, the, the world and from our different investigators. And I think those two hours of video are going to be chopped up into clips and go on the web. Um, so you still, you, you still can't escape uh, an update from me. So, when you, so soon online, you'll, you'll, you'll get to hear me yapping with my terrible Rhode Island accent, and you can't escape me that easily. But um, um, I'll stop there, and I guess I'll ask um, our, our, our moderator, the great John Hamilton, who has moderated panels um, before, who's a science reporter for NPR and, and does uh, great work. So welcome, John. And I'll leave it to John to do the official introductions of our esteemed panelists. And, um, and uh, look, I think we're in for a great show. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Welcome. It, it's uh, it's going to be fun talking to these scientists. I've had a chance to talk to them a little bit beforehand, and they all have some really great things to say. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time introducing them um, because I think there's there's stuff in your program that so I'm just not going to read all of their credentials and all that kind of stuff. Uh, all I'm going to say is that they bring three very different perspectives. Um, you have the lab perspective, you have clinical perspective, you have combinations of that, and they bring d very different. Uh, ways of looking at Alzheimer's, I think you're gonna find it really interesting to hear them talk about it. So, with luck, uh, we're gonna hear about not only Alzheimer's patients, but also about the substances in the brain that are thought to damage the brain, and about how scientists are hoping to stop or at least slow this process. So, let's start with uh, Ron Peterson of the Mayo Clinic. Um, he studies how the brain changes during normal aging, but he also does research on what happens in the brains of people who have Alzheimer's and other dementias. And I thought we might start by just having everybody talk a little bit from a personal point of view how they got into this field. And so, Ron, maybe you could talk a little bit about what led you to study Alzheimer's. Uh, well, thanks, John. Uh, you know, I same, kind of came at it uh, with a circuitous path, uh, which in retrospect looks perfectly planned, but in fact was not. So. In undergraduate school up in Minnesota, I kind of got interested in psychology of learning, memory, et cetera. Went to, med went to graduate school and got a PhD in what would now be called cognitive neuroscience because it's much more sophisticated. Back then it was called experimental psychology. But my, my focus of my PhD thesis was on how people remember, normal people remember, and what facilitates their memory, human imagery and things of that nature. I then got, you can tell by the color of my hair, I'm a, uh, a Vietnam era person. So the Vietnam era came into play and it ended up going to, uh, after graduate school, I ended up going in the Army, but to the Army's Biomedical Research Laboratory, Edgewood, Maryland. And in that context, I started studying drugs and memory because the military was interested in you know, what drugs affect memory. Uh, I'll take a little side side step here. All soldiers out in the field carry an injector with them, which has the compound atropine in it, and it's an antidote to nerve gas agents. But atropine is an anticholinergic agent, and it screws up the memory a bit. So they ask us the question, if people inject themselves with atropine, what's going to happen? So we studied, it's been three, four years studying those kinds of compounds and the effects of them on memory. That got me interested in the physiology, the pharmacology of memory, et cetera. The guys I was working with said, if you really like that work, you probably should go to medical school. Because as a psychologist, it's cute, but you know, you gotta you gotta be able to to really get into the medical side of it. So I did, I went to medical school, and then medical school went to do internship, residency, fellowship out here at Harvard, 
and and the the natural course then was to get into memory, learning, disease, neurology, and of course the disease then had to be Alzheimer's disease. Well, in retrospect, it looks like a perfectly planned program, but in fact, it was quite serendipitous along the way. So Ron, the other thing I'm gonna have you do is I'm gonna ask each of you to lay out sort of some of the fundamentals of, of Alzheimer's. And, and I thought you might start, you're a doctor, you're a clinician who, who sees patients, a little bit about what does Alzheimer's look like to a clinician? How does it impact families? And uh, what, how many people have, are battling this? Sure. So uh, everybody in this room knows what Alzheimer's disease looks like. So it is a clinical condition where people develop usually, not always, but usually memory, forgetfulness beyond what we'd see for normal aging, may affect other areas of cognition, attention, concentration, language, and affects the daily function. That's dementia. And then of the dementias, what is the cause? And Alzheimer's disease is typically the most common explanation. So in this slide, we can see that the common contributing factors to Alzheimer's disease are in fact what's encircled there, the amyloid, the A-beta, and our colleagues are gonna talk about this more expertly than I, and tau. But clinically, the people present with this gradual memory impairment. Now, it turns out in aging, all these other factors, and we'll come back to these other factors later on in the discussion, also contribute to the overall picture of a decline in memory, cognitive function in aging. Alzheimer's disease, however, is probably the most important component to this. So, uh, to get to John's question about what do we see in the clinic, these days, see a lot of people my age who come in and say, gee, I'm not remembering as well as I used to, maybe not remembering as well as I ought to, is this Alzheimer's disease? And I think the discussion tonight will say, well, is it or isn't it? And I don't want to preempt it, but in fact, that's the question. So what do we do? We do the medical, neurologic exam, cognitive exam, neuropsychological exam, do some imaging things, maybe a spinal tap, something of that nature that informs us on biomarkers to try to sort out that circle as to what are the contributing factors of that. So it's increasingly common in the clinic that primary care people are dealing with this and they're saying, what do I do with this? When this person, man, woman, comes in and says, I'm not remembering as well as I used to, where do I go next? So that's our challenge. And the numbers are rising, right? The numbers are horrendous. A recent report from CDC said that, you know, if we talk about 5 million people with Alzheimer's disease in the U.S., say in 2014, 2015, that number's going to probably triple. It's going to triple by the middle of this century. The cost to this country is, is enormous. $280 billion this year costing the system, two-thirds of which comes from the federal government. So this is an enormous cause that it costs that is really unsustainable. And I think that by the middle of this century, we're going to be spending about 1.1, 1.2 trillion dollars a year caring for people with Alzheimer's disease if we're not effective at having an inroad into this disease, slowing down the progression, delaying the onset. So that's the challenge. That's what got Congress's attention over the years, and, and I think uh, that's our mandate tonight to try to say where are we with regard to this problem. Uh, and since you brought up Congress, maybe you could say just a word about your, your work uh, chairing the Advisory Council for National Alzheimer's Plan. What is, what is that, and what is it, why did you become a part of it? That's a good question. I have no <laughs> idea why I became a part of it, but, uh, but in 2010, Congress unanimously, if you can believe that, unanimously uh, supported the National Alzheimer's Project Act, signed into law by President Obama in 2011, and part of that was to establish what was called the Advisory Council on Research Care and Services for the National Plan. And this committee, which I was honored to chair uh, for, for six years at least, was to generate a national plan for Alzheimer's disease across the spectrum, science as well as caregiving, as well as the social impact of the disease. And so, when we began that project or that, that challenge in 2011, the federal funding 
for Alzheimer's disease was about $450 million. It's escalated over the years, and now through awareness that the national plan has brought to people and to Congress, that's at right now about $1.9 billion. There's $425 million new dollars on the table right now that if the 2019 budget is passed, will in fact raise it to like $2.3 billion. Sounds like a lot of money, but where are we in comparison to other major diseases? Cancer, three to four billion. Heart disease, two to three billion. HIV, AIDS, three billion. Diabetes, one to two billion. So we're kind of getting into the ballpark of where we deserve to be because this is the disease that's going to have the greatest impact on the country, individuals, families, and the healthcare economy going forward. Great, thank you. And I want to turn now to uh, Bob Vassar, who's at Northwestern University. And he's a researcher there who does a lot of work with mouse models of Alzheimer's. He's also learned a lot about the substances in the brain that are thought to cause the disease. And why don't we start, Bob, just, just talk a little bit about, I mean, you've devoted your career to this disease in large part. Um, why? Well, thank you, John. Uh, it's great to be here tonight. Um, just to give you a little background about myself, I was an uh, undergraduate at University of Chicago and got a degree in biology. And I just, you know, at the end of my degree, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I thought, well, maybe I'll go to medical school, but, then, you know, my GPA wasn't all that great. So I thought, well, maybe, maybe not. So I, I became a technician, and I sort of, you know, felt like I was drifting for a while. Then my mother got the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, and that really shook me up. And I thought, okay, I've got to, you know, I've got to do something with my life. So that spurred me to go on to graduate school. Uh, I went to graduate school at the University of Chicago, got a degree in molecular genetics and cell biology. And, um, um, you know, I wanted to study Alzheimer's disease then, but at the time, this was 19, to reveal my age, uh, it was 1986 when I entered graduate school. And really, um, you know, Rudy had not come along yet to uh, discover APP. Uh, what? It was that year. Okay. It was very close. Yeah, I almost, I almost had. If I would have delayed a little bit longer, I, you know, I could have, I could have, I could have hitched on that, that train. But, but there was nobody studying molecular Alzheimer's disease at the time. So, I switched gears. I thought, all right, I, I better get my tools, my tool bag, uh, to study this disease. So I learned how to make transgenic mice with Elaine Fuchs, who is a uh, epidermal biologist. Uh, so I, I knew how to make mouse models at that point. And then Elaine told me, you know, you should you should get back into neurobiology. So um, I interviewed with Richard Axel at Columbia, who was studying olfaction. And, uh, and got into his lab for a postdoc as sort of a way to get back into neurobiology. And uh, at the end of that period of time, we, we made some great progress. And, and some of the work I did contributed to Richard's winning the Nobel Prize eventually with Linda Buck. But um, I was really more, I could have gone on to study olfaction, but I was more interested in Alzheimer's. And an opportunity at the biotech Technology company Amgen came up, and uh, and I took it, and it was there where we discovered base, uh, the beta secretase enzyme. Now here's a few papers here that are more recent than that. That was 1999. Uh, fast forward to the last few years, we've done work um, on base conditional knockout mice to study what this enzyme does. As Rudy mentioned, it's the beta secretase enzyme. It's one of the molecular scissors that helps generate the amyloid that we'll, we'll talk about. And, um, you know, there are drugs in clinical trial right now to block this enzyme, and it's important for us to know what function it has in the brain and the rest of the body, because if we're going to block it, uh, we need to know if there are going to be side effects. And, and we found one such side effect in, in the brain um, in, in recently published in Science Translational Medicine. Uh, and it could be important for memory. So we don't want to create a memory disease to try to cure a memory disease. So that, that's and, and Bob, I'm going to ask you a bit more about base one. Uh, right. 
later on, but I was hoping right now what you could do is the sort of second part of the sort of basics of, of uh, Alzheimer's, explain a little bit about um, what is going on in the brain and in the cells as this uh, disease shows up. We could, uh, there we, yeah, that's the slide I wanted to show. So these, uh, this slide here is show, are showing the three hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease at a, uh, a microscopic level. So if you take an autopsy brain and uh, cut it into thin sections and stain it with particular compounds and look at it in the microscope, this is what you see. Uh, there are three hallmark uh, pathologies, uh, the amyloid plaques, the neurofibrillary tangles or the tau tangles, and then neuroinflammation. Um, and uh, the amyloid appears to be, it's, it's made of a, a sticky compound called beta amyloid. It's a, a, a small protein that actually forms these plaques, like you've heard about plaques in the um, blood vessels of the heart. Well, this is a different type of plaque that occurs in the brain. And it, it is a sticky compound that gums up the brain and it, it is kind of an irritant, if you will, and it causes the innate immune systems of the uh, immune cells of the brain, the microglia, to home in on it and start trying to get rid of it. And that's part of the neuroinflammation that you see at the bottom. But the microglia can't do the job. You know, it's, it's, they're overwhelmed. Uh, there may be collateral damage to neurons um, and, and neuro, neuron death. And at some point, the tau tangles form. We think that amyloid comes first, and then that creates the, the toxicity that leads to the inflammation, and then finally the, the tau tangles. So they all sort of relate to one another in a compli complicated manner. Finally, we get to neurodegeneration. If you look at the, the, uh, the brain on the right, you can see that at the end of life, uh, there's quite a lot of brain atrophy because of the loss of, of neurons. And, you know, we're, we're doing a lot in, in terms of mouse modeling of these pathologies, which I think have helped us come a long way in terms of understanding the pathology. The mice, however, have their limitations because they only live for two years. And as you know, people live a lot longer than that. And in fact, uh, the disease may take 20, 10 or 20 years for the amyloid to accumulate to the point that people end up having uh, the tau tangles and memory problems. So, um, but, but we do learn a lot from the mouse model. And we're gonna, we're gonna delve deeper into that as well okay. a little bit later. But right now, since uh, Rudy started with the baseball, I think we'll, we'll say that uh, we've got our cleanup hitter here, uh, Teresa Gomez Isla, who is a neurologist at Mass General up the street. And she is a bit like Ron in that she studies people with Alzheimer's, but uh, she's also a bit like Bob in that she has a lab that studies mice. And uh, why don't we start with you where we started with everybody, which is, and you were trained in Madrid, right? And so is that where you became interested in this disease? Yeah, well, good evening and thank you. Yeah, I am from Madrid and that's where I was raised and that's where I went to medical school. And actually, um, I became interested in Alzheimer's disease very early on, uh, while I was a medical student, um, the very first time I actually saw an Alzheimer's patient. And I remember I was uh, very impacted just learning that a disease can just steal uh, one of the uh, treasures that we have as human beings, our memories. But I do remember being even more impacted uh, by the suffering of uh, the patient's spouse and uh, their children. So um, shortly after that, I actually decided that I, was, uh, I would train as a neurologist uh, and uh, that I would you know, try to contribute to find a cure uh, for this disease. Um, the one thing I realized, and um, probably this is not much different anywhere around the world, is that in medical school, um, as we were um, mentioning earlier, they teach you about research, but they don't actually uh, tell you how to do research. Uh, so you learn uh, that research is important, but they don't teach you how to be a researcher. So that's why I came to Boston to uh, pursue my fellowship and a PhD. And that's why, yeah, I'm half and half. 
So <laughs> I spent half of my life in, in clinic uh, providing care for patients and their families, and then the other half of my life uh, in the lab thinking hard um, what I can do to help those patients with better treatment. The other thing I'd like you to do is put together a little bit. We've heard from Ron and Bob about what, what patients look like and experience, how many there are. We've heard a little bit about pathology in the brain. What I'd like you to do is talk about what is the connection between what's going on in the brain, the plaques and tangles, and what you see in terms of symptoms? Okay, so I think um, I have a slide that I can use. I, I will just need a pointer if uh, there is one. Sure. Do we have a pointer out there, there is for a Teresa? Somewhere. I'm just gonna. Yeah, there is one right here. I'm not sure if it works though. Um, so, you know, one thing we know now is that um, amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles um, start building um, in the brain of Alzheimer's patients for many, many years and probably decades. So they um, start slowly um, accumulating plaques as well as tangles um, during this uh, very long silent, asymptomatic uh, phase of the disease. So by the time uh, patients develop the uh, very first clinical symptoms of the disease in um, most brains, there is already uh, a significant amount of both amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles. And once you've uh, developed symptoms, uh, the amount of uh, um, amyloid deposits actually does not increase uh, too much anymore. It levels off, it reaches uh, pretty much a plateau. Uh, the number of tangles, though, uh, keep increases, increasing as the uh, um, clinical symptoms keep progressing. And along with that tangle formation, we start seeing uh, progressive uh, loss of neurons and synapses, I, I mean neuronal uh, connections that also correlate very well with the uh, progression of uh, cognitive deficits and clinical symptoms that these patients uh, develop. Um, there is another element that was just mentioned that I also think is uh, very important and that we normally don't include in any of these graphs, uh, and is that um, very much from the beginning of the disease, along with plaques and tangles, we do get to see an inflammatory reaction in the brain of Alzheimer's patients. And that uh, inflammation also keeps increasing as the disease and the symptoms uh, progress. Um, we don't know what it means. I mean, for a long time, you know, we've been trying to figure out whether is this uh, a protective mechanism? Uh, is this a deleterious mechanism uh, or, or reaction for neurons? Or is it just a bystander? Um, but definitely something that uh, more and more uh, often we are paying attention to uh, these days. Okay, thank you. So now I'd like to move on to, I've, I've identified several topics I'd like us to get through. We're, and, and I should say that, that there is much this evening that's going to be about hope. But we're going to start at the other end. <laughs> we're going to start with failure. And if there's a perception in the public that there's been a lot of scientific struggle in, in Alzheimer's research, um, I'm probably part of the problem. Like a lot of journalists over the past 20 years, I've covered a number of uh, drug trials, drugs designed to treat Alzheimer's that have failed. They have not done what they were designed to do. And so I thought we should talk a little bit about <clears throat> why Alzheimer's has been so tough. To, to, uh, to treat. So Bob, let's, let's start with you. Is, you know, these drugs, the ones that I first covered until recently, there's some drugs going in other directions, but the early drugs and what we would term failures have, have been going after amyloid. So you explain how amyloid works in the brain. Explain uh, whether amyloid is even the right target. Well, that's a great question, John. It's, it's uh, one that the field really struggles with. Um, but I really think that the, uh, and, and this is evidence from Rudy's lab and many other labs, that, that 
the genetics, the human genetics really points to a role for amyloid as a causative agent in the, the, the human disease. And when, when you say the genetics, there have been studies of people who have certain genes that... Right. In amyloid precursor protein, the gene that Rudy discovered, presenilin pre genes 1 and 2, Rudy also discovered them, uh, and, and there have been mutations scattered throughout these proteins that lead to autosomal dominant forms of, of Alzheimer's disease. And we've learned a lot from, from these genetic these uh, uh, genetic forms of Alzheimer's disease. We make our mouse models with these same human genes with the mutations, and they replicate those pathologies that I showed in a previous slide. So they're, you know, it's, it's, it's clear that, that, that one road to get to Alzheimer's disease is, is by putting mutations in these genes that increase the production of amyloid. In particular, there's a form of amyloid called A beta 42, which is particularly sticky and, and forms these plaques very readily in the brain. And we know if you do that, mut mutations that lead to that will cause familial autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease. To me, that's, that's uh, some of the strongest evidence that amyloid is the right target. Now, now the question is, you know, why, why have these drugs failed? Right? And, and there have been antibodies that have been targeting um, a beta, uh, beta amyloid, to remove it from the brain. And they um, do that, right? And they, do, they um, initially Someday. no, initially no, because I think the initial attempts uh, were, uh, you know, maybe not enough antibody was given, um, and maybe, maybe the antibodies were not to the right part of the amyloid protein to remove it or to, 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 to clear it out of the brain. So, so there's some open questions there. But, uh, but the ones now, in particular, aducanumab, which is a, you know, an antibody that Biogen is, uh, is, is in clinical trial right now, is looking good. It really does a fantastic job clearing amyloid out of the brain. And at least in the early clinical trials with small numbers of patients, there was a hint at, uh, at some slowing of cognitive decline in those individuals. And that was dose-dependent, meaning the more amyloid you removed, the the, the, the more slowing of cognitive decline that, that they got. Of course, they, they kept going down. Uh, you know, these people had early Alzheimer's disease. And I think that gets to my main point about why we have failures. And it's, it's that we are, all, the, all the, the, the trials to date have been with individuals that have had early Alzheimer's disease and have had memory problems. And I think for the A beta, as you see from the, the curve right here, that um, there's a period of maybe 10 or 20 years where amyloid is slowly building. And by the time people reach MCI, which is mild cognitive impairment, they've got memory complaints, but they don't really have Alzheimer dementia yet. That happens with the second um, uh, uh, line to the right. So there's a lot of damage done to the brain at that point. And, and giving a person the the amyloid drugs at that point is, is probably too late. This is similar to the statin drugs. Statin drugs, as you know, are great prevention drugs for heart disease. Um, but if you give a person with heart failure a statin drug, it's not going to help them. You know, they're, they're, the damage to their heart is already done. Alzheimer's disease is like brain failure. And, and so I think an amyloid drug at that stage of the disease is just too late. So we need, to, we need prevention trials, and Ron has been a pioneer in that area. Um, we need to, to start the treatment in the pre-symptomatic phase uh, before there are memory problems, and maybe, maybe in that part of the red curve that, uh, where you can see it's, it's, uh, it's, it's gradually going up. We want to get as early and as to the lowest part of that curve um, before the tau pathology starts taking off. And, and I th there are clinical trials, prevention trials that are being planned right now. And, and, and uh, these trials are going to involve people that have amyloid in the brain uh, via a brain scan, um, but they have normal memory. So this is really the group of patients that we want to test the amyloid hypothesis in. And I'm actually going to ask Teresa to talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. But before you do, uh, Bob, there's one other thing I'd like you to talk about, just because it's, it's uh, square in your area of expertise. You do a lot of work with rodents. And 
<clears throat> yet rodents have proven to be a, a somewhat problematic model for Alzheimer's in some cases. Why? Well, I guess it depends on your perspective. I don't particularly see them as problematic. Um, <laughs> Let me put it know, this way. They, they, they're you, my you bread go to, and butter. You go to the neuroscience meeting and people tell jokes about how many times they've cured Alzheimer's in mice. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it's easy to cure Alzheimer's in a mouse, you know. But the, my, you have to think about this for a second. Mice live for two years, and that's it. You know, we live 80, 90, 100 years. And, and, you know, the, the amount of time that it takes the amyloid to even accumulate in the brain of a person is like five times the life of, lifespan of a mouse. And in addition to the, the age issue, mice have a very simple brain. Their, their brain is the size of a walnut, okay? And, and it's, a, it's a smooth cortex. It's not, it doesn't have the, 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 the number of cells, the... the the surface area or the complexity of the human brain. And, and you know, of course, mice, you know, we, we, do, we run memory tests on these mice. And you can see effects of amyloid and tau on memory. Um, but it's, and I think that the, the mice are giving us an accurate picture of the pathology, you know, those plaques, those tangles, and the neuroinflammation. I think that's all on the money. But the problem is the timing in relationship to human disease. And, and so, um, you know, these, uh, what, what we're only finding out more recently now that we have brain scans and other biomarkers to fo longitudinally follow the, the, the course of the disease in humans, we are finding out that these, these insidious processes are going on years before there is any, um, you know, uh, readout in terms of memory. And, and of course, we don't have that in the mouse. But they're still great, you know, if you want to call them test tubes, to be able to do experiments with. It's just as hard to test an actual Alzheimer's drug for people in mice and know for sure how it's going to translate. Right. Well, we do. We do test the Alzheimer drugs in people. Oh, I'm sorry, in mice. And then we try, and then we get, we get positive results in the mice. Then we go to the people, but we treat the Alzheimer patients. And they don't work because it's too late. I think... When, especially when you're focusing on amyloid, you have to, I mean, it's only now that we're getting to the point of designing prevention trials, and, and they're just taking off. That's where we're going to see effects uh, with the amyloid drugs. And Teresa, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about one of the other challenges was knowing when to start treatment, right? And there's, that's been an evolving <laughs> debate over the past couple of decades. Talk about that. So, um, I mean, I, I think that uh, pretty much everybody would agree that, you know, uh, the earliest, the better. I mean, um, I actually uh, brought this slide um, because, you know, um, this is a good memory. It's part of my very first collaboration with Dr. Peterson when I first uh, arrived into Boston. Um, this is just to show you how... Um, amyloid plaques start accumulating in different areas of the uh, neocortex, uh, which is like the outermost layer of the brain responsible for thinking and for processing information from the five senses. Uh, but the uh, pattern of amyloid uh, distribution is actually a lot less predictable than the pattern of tangles. Tangles, uh, tau pathology, has a very, very um, special distribution uh, in um, the brain of Alzheimer's patients. So the, uh, sorry, how do I go back? No way. Go back? Yeah. So the um, very first area in uh, Alzheimer's disease that develops uh, neurofibrillary tangles is this area of the brain that is called the entorhinal cortex. Uh, this area is key for memory formation, and that explains why in most uh, patients, the uh, very first symptoms of the disease um, are, is going to be uh, memory loss. Now, one thing that um, we've known for, for a long time is that um, after that first region get, gets hit by um, neurofibrillary tangle pathology, um, 
there are going to be other areas within the medial temporal lobe that later on are also going to be um, start uh, developing neurofibrillary tangles and eventually um, you get to see tangles as the clinical symptoms of the disease progress um, throughout uh, the different uh, regions of the neocortex. We've actually learned, uh, we now know why, and, and the reason is that this tau protein um, can spread um, between uh, cells that are connected, and that explains this very um, stereotypical pattern of temporal and regional progression of the uh, tau pathology. Now, what's the problem? That, again, by the time somebody develops the very first symptoms, uh, there is already uh, a, a very large amount of plaques and a significant amount of tangles that are not longer confined to the entorhinal cortex, but are already affecting um, other brain regions. And that long presymptomatic window, until very recently, um, is something that we couldn't see. We didn't have any imaging techniques that would allow us to actually figure out who, what individuals uh, are harboring in the brain amyloid uh, plaques and neurofibrillary tangles versus uh, what individuals are not in the absence of symptoms. But that has changed, as you know, in the past uh, few years when uh, novel uh, imaging techniques uh, based on positron emission tomography and, and amyloid, uh, um, um, by, uh, amyloid um, tracers, and now more recently also tau tracers are allowing us for the very first time uh, to actually see amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles in the human living brain. So we have a very, very good opportunity uh, for the first time to try uh, uh, preventive uh, um, interventions in, in this uh, population of individuals who have Alzheimer's pathology yet uh, have not developed uh, Alzheimer's symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. What I was trying to point out is that um, this is um, a study that we conducted in collaboration with Ron uh, many years ago and um, getting to the point that, you know, when is the right time to intervene? as early as possible, uh, yet we cannot forget that, you know, patients keep coming to our clinic and they do have symptoms, and I'm not giving up on those, so. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, several years ago, we actually um, studied in detail some brains from individual who, individuals who have only minimal symptoms of memory loss. And we looked at that region, the entorhinal cortex, and what we, and we counted the neurons uh, that were there. And what we saw is that even at those very, very mild uh, symptomatic stages of the disease, more than one third of the neurons that are sub supposed to be in the entorhinal cortex were al already lost. So this was giving us an idea that by the time we um, tell a patient you have mild cognitive impairment, if the underlying pathology of that cognitive impairment is an Alzheimer's disease, there is already irreversible damage in that brain. So um, that's why, you know, intervening earlier um, makes a lot of sense. Thank you. It's, it's interesting to me. I love how the scientists take a failure and immediately extend it into how they conquered the problem and how it's no longer a failure, which is the process of science. And, and I think failure is a really good teacher. I mean, it's a hard way to learn uh, lessons, but, but I think we have. Just to, uh, to finish up on the failure theme, Ron, maybe you could talk a little bit about, and, and you often talk about how complicated dementias are. <clears throat> Has that been an obstacle? I mean, is that something that, that slowed progress in trying to treat this, this disease? Well, I, I think so, through the natural evolution of what we've done in clinical trials, that we've taken, and I'm a clinician, so we've taken people who fit the profile for Alzheimer's disease and put them into a clinical trial. But in fact, some recent studies, major pharmaceutical trials of bapinuzumab, solanizumab, have indicated that people who, in a particular subgroup, Rudy's subgroup of, say, apolipoprotein E4 negative people who still fit the clinical profile for forgetfulness, cognitive impairment, impairment in daily function, looks like dementia, should be Alzheimer's disease. But in fact, in those clinical trials, up to 30% of the people did not have amyloid in the brain. 
So if you've got an antibody that's targeting amyloid in the brain, and 30% of the people in that subgroup of your clinical trial don't have it, you're doomed from the get-go. So that trial is going to fail because of the poor selection, not poor, but the inappropriate selection uh, due to the technology of the times that that trial engaged. So now I think where we are in the field is that as, as Bob and Teresa have indicated, we can be much more specific in clinically profiling people. So they have the clinical picture, forgetfulness, cognitive impairment, functional impairment, or maybe just forgetfulness at the MCI stage, but now we can image them or we can do cerebrospinal fluid, lumbar punctures, and see that they in fact have the amyloid protein in the brain. Okay, now you qualify for the trial of an anti-amyloid therapy. So I'm hopeful that that is where we're headed. Almost all trials now that are being designed have these kinds of biomarker requirements before you get into the trial. And I think that's going to reduce the noise in the trial such that we're going to be more specifically treating the target that we're intending. Since you've got the mic anyway, why don't, why don't we go on, let's move to the, to the next section about what has changed. And why don't you start because as I understand it, um, Mayo was the place that treated Ronald Reagan many years ago. And it might be an interesting milestone to look back to that and talk about now and talk about what's changed. Sure, when, when President Reagan announced his diagnosis in 1994, um, it, it was a state where, well, we were dealing with some drugs that could treat neurotransmitters in the brain, the cholinergic system and the like. But that was about it. We had this clinical profile, and you give the drug uh, cholinesterase inhibitors to try to modulate the amount of that neurochemical in the brain. Fast forward, where we've come through, through our colleagues and Rudy and, and what the Cure Alzheimer's Fund has, has uh, supported over the past years, we've learned so much more about the biology of the disease. We know now what the key features are of the disease, how we can measure them in the brain of living people, and now we've developed techniques to go in there and get it. So uh, Bob mentioned a drug that, in fact, goes in and gets the amyloid out of the brain. In fact, that's the case. I mean, in a dose-responsive fashion, the more of the antibody you give, the more amyloid that gets removed from the brain. Uh, possible clinical signal there, that, that it may in fact be impacting the clinical function of the person. So I think that is so much farther ahead than where we were in 1994 in terms of where we are understanding the disease and attacking it in a much more focused fashion. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, before we move on, uh, uh, I just wanted to mention about failures. There is another drug, solanuzumab, which was a Lilly antibody, which uh, was to a different part of, you know, it recognized a different part of the, the A-beta molecule. And it, it technically failed its, its clinical trial. But there were some, you know, if you look, if, you know, in post hoc analysis, it, actually they've, they, they missed getting uh, uh, their primary outcome on the last, the last uh, uh, time point. But the previous, the earlier time points in their clinical trial were, were statistically significant. <coughs> And then when you looked at their secondary measures, they had uh, some secondary measures, measures that were also statistically significant. So technically the trial failed, but there were signals there indicating that that, there, that, that antibody, maybe if given at a higher dose, would have, uh, and maybe given earlier, might have been successful. Tracy, you look like you have something to add. Going back to failure again, I mean, I think, um, you know, another factor that probably explains at least in part why some trials uh, may have failed, is that um, we've been enrolling uh, a very heterogeneous population of patients in many of these trials. Um, and you know, Ron mentioned, and that's true, that there was a significant percentage of uh, individuals who to begin with did not have uh, Alzheimer's disease. And, and, and they that's might have dementia that's caused exactly by... Exactly, by other, other causes, and, and the problem is that based only on clinical symptoms, even if you are an expert, you fail. I mean, um, and you know, there is a small percentage of patients that will have something else that doesn't explain. Well, we don't it. fail, we misidentify. <laughs> you know, exactly. respect. You I learn. need a job, I need you a learn. job, right? You learn. <laughs> so, um, the, 
Not only that, but actually, uh, when you see in clinic, you know, uh, you just need to see a, a small group of patients to come to the conclusion that the rate of uh, progression of their clinical, uh, um, their cognitive decline is very different from one individual to another individual. I mean, you may see people who very, you know, who progress uh, over the course of like three, four, five years, and they become uh, severely demented at the end of uh, that time frame, as opposed to other people who may just very, very slowly decline over 10, 15, even 20 years. And we need to better understand uh, what are the factors that contribute to the clinical and the pathological heterogeneity. I mean, Ron mentioned there is very frequently concomitant pathology other than plaques and tangles that it may explain part of this heterogeneity. Um, and and um, so that's definitely something that is bringing a lot of noise to some of the clinical trials uh, that um, have failed. Having imaging now uh, to be able to use that in the screening process, uh, I think is going to be a big advantage. Because can, can you just walk people through, so if, if the trials that are being done now, people, several people have alluded to how they're being done differently. So you're, how do you, what are you doing beyond looking at clinical symptoms? Is, are you actually looking at levels of tau and amyloid? Yeah, so um, I mean, uh, we, uh, many of the clinical trials that are currently ongoing um, are incorporating these novel imaging techniques. Uh, first of all, again, to make sure that you, know, you are enrolling patients with Alzheimer's disease. So to even get into the trial, even you have to have in, your to brain image to show that you have. It's a way to add uh, more evidence that that's their uh, diagnosis. So um, the clinical diagnosis in many trials has actually to be corroborated by this new uh, neuroimaging um, biomarkers. Uh, the other piece of information that you get from these imaging techniques is going to be at what stage uh, um, these individuals are. Um, so again, I mean, in the when we start thinking about what can we learn uh, from from these fail failures, you know, um, one thing I think we we have learned is that it's going to be again important to try to run clinical trials with a homogeneous uh, population of participants, uh, both in terms of, you know, the clinical stage of the disease as well as the uh, pathological stage of the disease. Do you want to add something, Ron? Yes, yeah, so, so along that line, uh, Teresa, as you and Bob know very well, earlier this year there was a paper published uh, indicating it's a research framework, but it's suggesting that, in fact, Alzheimer's disease should be defined by its pathologic characteristics, the presence of plaques and tangles, plaques with amyloid, tangles with tau. And that's the definition of the disease, irrespective of the clinical state of the person. Now, that's a sea change. It sounds sort of obvious, but it's really a big deal because people who are clinically normal, functioning in the society completely normally, but for one reason or another have plaques and tangles in their brain because they were in, say, a research study or something, they have Alzheimer's disease. They could have mild cognitive impairment, they could have dementia, but that's a, gonna be a big shift for society, for clinicians, for everybody, because now most of us think of the person with Alzheimer's disease as having clinical dementia, clinically impaired, that's Alzheimer's disease. But now we're suggesting, or the framework is suggesting, that Alzheimer's disease be defined on its biologic characteristics only, just like you do with prostate cancer. If I have a prostate biopsy, I have Gleason 3, 4, I got prostate cancer. It may not affect me in my entire life, but I got prostate cancer, breast cancer, and on and on. So Alzheimer's disease now is moving into, the suggestion is to move into the biologic realm and that will refine our treatments for and our treatment trials for Alzheimer's disease therapies. Bob, maybe you could add, add something about how the science has moved beyond just amyloid and tau, getting into, well, I'll let you explain it. <laughs> you work with, with base one, which I, I believe when I talked to you years and years ago, I interviewed you and, and you, you explained to me that it was like, a, like molecular scissors. So <laughs> explain why that is. Right, well, that's, that's my favorite enzyme, BASE, which Rudy alluded to earlier. And, and, but we're still talking about amyloid with BASE, because BASE is one of the enzymes which really are, you can think of them as molecular scissors, as I described, 
uh, where you know you need you need these two molecular scissors. One is base, and the other one is called uh, enzyme is called gamma secretase. You need both of them to to chop out the uh, the 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 snippet of amyloid out of the amyloid precursor protein, which is a much larger protein, and and those and that's why you need molecular scissors. Once you do the chopping, and then the am amyloid floats out of the neuron, it it gets stuck uh, in between neurons, begins to accumulate, and that's why you get Alzheimer's disease. But could you say a little bit more about, I mean, people, amyloid used to be sort of a catch-all term. Now people talk about, like, subcategories of amyloid. Can you explain how that has evolved? Um, well, you know, the, you, you have different types of amyloid. You have, uh, you have the soluble amyloid, so when it's first made, it's, it's just a single molecule of amyloid that floats out of the neuron. But then it meets up with other single molecules, you know, like a dating site, I suppose, for amyloid. They, they come together and, and they form <laughs> soirees. It's, it's, uh, it's, you know, these are like uh, oligom they, they're called oligomers. And th this, these little uh, oligomers may, may be about a dozen or so uh, of, of, of amyloid molecules that come together. They seem to be quite toxic, at least in some experiments, and, and disrupt the function of the synapse. The synapse is the connection between neurons where the communication between nerve cells occurs. And so there's been a lot of work on these soluble forms of amyloid, which float around, and they could be pretty nasty because they're, they're just wreaking havoc all over the brain because they're not anchored down. Eventually, maybe the, you know, some of them or a different form of the amyloid gloms down and gets anchored between the neurons and begins to form a plaque. Some people believe the plaques are, are not toxic. I uh, am of the, the, the old school, which believes that amyloid plaques are, are bad because we see in the vicinity of amyloid plaques, some of my own work, is to look at the formation of what are called dystrophic neurites. These are the appendages of the neurons that are in the local um, environment of the plaque, they, they, they swell up and they accumulate a lot of junk inside of them. And these are very dysfunctional uh, appendages of the neuron. And, and uh, we think we're, we're on to an idea of why they form and why amyloid causes them. And we think that's why amyloid plaques are bad. So there's a lot of bad stuff about amyloid. You know, it's not... It's not <laughs> You know, and some forms just, of it may be worse yeah, than others. Well, multiple forms. And right. you may want a drug that goes after one form but not others, right? Correct, correct. And, and then you've got, you know, you, and these changes in the dystrophic neurites may be stimulating the formation of the abnormal tau, which goes on to form the tangles. And, and there's been excitement recently in the last several years about how the tau may be spreading from one neuron to the next down the chain of connections, much like a, a prion does. And I don't know if that's... Mad a, cow disease. What's that? Mad cow disease. Mad cow disease, right? And, and so uh, there's been a lot of work in that area, which is quite exciting. Um, you know, maybe there are... And there, actually, there are tau therapies under development now uh, that are antibodies, anti-tau antibodies that might be able to grab that tau as it's jumping between the neuron and, and pull it out of the brain, which could be an interesting therapeutic approach. But we don't yet know, these are early clinical trials, and we don't yet know whether they're going to work. The other, the other uh, uh, approach is uh, neuroinflammation. Um, you know, the, uh, there's, there are genes uh, that Rudy's lab has discovered that are expressed by the microglial cells. These are the innate immune system uh, uh, cells of the brain. They, uh, these genes that are expressed, one's called TREM2, the other one's CD33, and they're involved in the, the, the homing in of the microglia onto the plaque, and perhaps the microglia are there to wall off the plaque. They do respond to the plaque in some way, in probably a protective fashion. And you know, what you're talking about is a sort of immune response. Yeah. In the, it's like trying to kill off a bad thing in the brain and in the process. Right, and, stuff and, the, and, the, and, the, and the microglia are, are overwhelmed and they can't you know, do a good job of it and, and, and maybe there's also collateral damage because they're producing a lot of inflammatory uh, products in their, in their fight to, to, to wall off the plaque. 
Um, and, and there are a number of other exciting areas that the Cure Alzheimer's Fund uh, is investigating. You know, it's a complex disease. In fact, Alzheimer's may not be just one disease. It may be a whole spectrum uh, from, you know, the, the clues that we're getting from the genetics. Um, that there are, you know, at least dozens, perhaps, maybe even hundreds of genes that are involved in, in causing Alzheimer's disease. And, uh, you know, maybe you could say there might be hundreds of different types of Alzheimer's that all lead to the, maybe the same endpoint. But uh, anyway, there's a lot of interesting work going on. True to, true to form, you all have jumped ahead of me right into hope. Um, and as long as, as, long as we, we've arrived at that topic, Teresa, could you talk a little bit about um, resilience, this idea that, that there are some people who can have brains that look terrible when you imaging, image them, but they're actually, and, and explain what that tells us and why that might be something that is really promising and hopeful. So, um, you know, I mean, um, this is something that we've known uh, for a long time uh, from autopsy um, studies. Um, uh, it happens every now and then, and now perhaps uh, we know it happens a little bit more often than we thought, that you come across brains from individuals whose cognition was very well sustained till they died. Yet when you uh, look at uh, that brain under the microscope, uh, you see a uh, significant amount of uh, Alzheimer's pathology, both um, amyloid uh, plaques and uh, neurofibrillary tangles. Um, now that uh, we are able to see um, those uh, um, lesions in vivo, I should say, though, that tau tracers, we are still validating those. They pretty much, this is something that has been happening for the past couple of years. So we need to make sure that what we see here uh, in red and yellow uh, in this um, PET scan using a, a tau tracer um, are actually neurofibrillary tangles. But so far, um, it, it looks like um, these uh, tau tracers are going to be very promising and, and uh, very useful. So um, what I was saying is that now that we can see in vivo both um, amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles, uh, what we are finding, um, and especially with amyloid uh, tracers, because uh, those have been around for, for um, um, much longer, is that um, up to 30% of subjects who are 70 and older uh, actually have amyloid, uh, positive amyloid scans, and yet they do not have symptoms of the disease. So there are two possibilities. One is, well, perhaps these are individuals that, um, you know, if they live longer, they will eventually uh, develop symptoms of the disease. Uh, but another possibility is that at least some of those individuals uh, may just be resilient to um, Alzheimer's pathology in their brain. And I have to say that uh, resilience is actually something that it's seen not only uh, you know, in this field, but in many other fields. For example, um, in the um, HIV uh, field, um, it was discovered that a very, very small percentage of uh, people uh, were carrying just as you know, um, genetic uh, uh, variation uh, of one of the receptors that is supposed to be key for the virus to be able to get into uh, lymphocytes. And that um, discovery actually, so those people, even though they may uh, have uh, the virus in their bloodstream, uh, they do not develop AIDS. Um, so that discovery of uh, resilience in these individuals, just based on this uh, genetic, uh, you know, fortune, uh, was enough to actually pursue uh, um, a new drug and, and, and just trying to mimic that mechanism. And, and this is a drug that actually um, is useful uh, uh, for, you know, many patients. Um, so um, the idea of studying resilience is um, precisely trying to figure out whether these brains from individuals that come to autopsy have a lot of uh, plaques and tangles, but no clinical signs of dementia, could offer uh, some clues um, to try to figure out what's different in those brains. What are the mechanisms that you know may be protecting the function and, and the survival of those neurons? And again, the idea is very simple: is can we mimic uh, with medications uh, the natural resilience of uh, 
of these individuals. So I just want to show you one slide um, so you can take a look at um, these brains. This, has, this is actually a project that um, we're working on in collaboration again with uh, Ronald Peterson, with several other institutions across the US. Uh, so everyone has been looking into their brain banks, trying to figure out how many of these resilient brains they have, and they have sent it to um, our lab. I'm uh, very grateful because uh, Cure for Alzheimer's is um, also helping us with this project now. Um, so the very first thing when we um, took a closer look to these brains was to make sure that they actually were well matched in terms of uh, number of plaques and number of tangles that they were harboring uh, when compared to individuals who had died uh, with a clinical diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, were severely demented, and then their brains so, uh, also show uh, the uh, pathology. So this is just an example um, of uh, a resilient brain. Uh, these are amyloid plaques. This is an example of a um, severely demented Alzheimer's patient at time of death. And you can see that there is um, a similar uh, amount of plaques in these brains. Um, th these are neurofibrillary tangles in the brain of uh, one of these uh, uh, resilient individuals and tangles in the brain of a severely demented Alzheimer's patient. Again, um, we have now taken a look to um, several of these brains, and um, they are really well matched in terms of uh, um, amyloid burden and uh, tau pathology burden. What's uh, different, and, and uh, sorry, can I go back? I, I don't know what I keep doing, but uh, okay. Um, what it's um, different, and, and again, this is uh, really striking, is that um, what you see here in purple, these are neurons. So even though those neurons contain many tangles and there are many plaques around them, the neurons are still there. They, are, they were alive, they were functioning in, in these uh, individuals, as opposed to what we normally see in profoundly de uh, demented patients with Alzheimer's disease, where um, the amount of neuronal loss is uh, um, just uh, um, devastating. Um, but there was one more thing that uh, is actually quite different in these resilient brains. As I mentioned earlier, uh, pretty much from the beginning of the disease, the brain also exhibits an inflammatory response that keeps increasing as the number of plaques and tangles keep accumulating. And this is something that you can see here. These are activated astrocytes, activated microglial cells in the brain of uh, uh, severely demented um, Alzheimer's brains. Um, these glial cells are going to produce uh, molecules that are called cytokines that contribute to uh, inflammation. And what was very surprising is that the, brain, uh, the brains of uh, resilient individuals, what you see here is that the inflammatory response is suppressed. We have uh, actually a paper that um, hopefully will be coming out shortly uh, looking at the profile of uh, what this glia is producing. And it looks like the molecules that they are producing in resilient brains and in uh, uh, demented uh, individuals with Alzheimer's disease is also different. So again, the idea of this project is to search for clues to hopefully um, inform novel drug discovery. Ron, could you, could you talk a little bit about your idea that, that Alzheimer's may be more than one problem or dementia has many causes and it may, be, may require many treatments? Absolutely. I mean, I think that ultimately where we're going, and, and the optimism in the field is that with the advent of biomarkers, we're able to tease apart the different, different components of cognition and aging. And uh, Lisa, if we could put up that other slide uh, that really looks at the complexity of what contributes to cognitive aging and decline. We've talked about Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is one component, a very important component. So complex slide here, but if you look in the middle, the hub is sort of the clinical progression, cognitively normal, mild cognitive impairment, dementia. And then the spokes going out of that wheel are various components that could contribute to that. So on the top there is amyloid, very important. To the upper, what, two o'clock, I guess, is tau. So those two components comprise Alzheimer's disease and they're absolutely essential. 
But if you look at brains of aging people, people in their 70s and 80s who have cognitive impairment, there are a bunch of other features to this. So there may be things like in, uh, I guess that's eight o'clock down on the lower left, alpha-synuclein that makes Lewy bodies that we see in Parkinson's disease. Well, the contribution of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease really coexist quite commonly. And in the upper left there at 10 o'clock, we see this protein called TDP43, another protein that particularly focuses on the hippocampus, that memory part of the brain, and could cause memory impairment. That's commonly seen in aging in people with Alzheimer's disease as well. At the six o'clock position on the bottom, we've got vascular disease. No doubt vascular disease is a contributing component to cognitive impairment. S big vessel disease, small vessel disease, micro vessel disease. So all of these features contribute, and then to be uh, somewhat humble, I'm sure there are a bunch of other things we haven't discovered in the other paradigm. So in the yellow ring around the outside there, we're trying to develop biomarkers for each one of these various components that contribute to the picture. Why? Because in the orange ring on the outside are treatments. So we're trying to develop treatments for the amyloid protein, the tau protein, but also treatments for alpha-synuclein, TDP43, vascular disease. So beyond my lifetime, unfortunately, but down the road, we're going to be seeing probably a profile so an individual comes in who has some degree of cognitive impairment. It'd be nice if we didn't have to do PET scans and spinal taps, but we had blood measures that looked at each of these individual components so that a person would get a blood profile saying you have X degree percent of amyloid, you have so much tau, you have alpha-synuclein, and there's the good news, we have therapies. We have treatments for each of those components. And, and that ultimately, it's going to take combination therapy down the road to treat this. Alzheimer's disease, essential, very big component, and it may be just Alzheimer's therapy that's going to impact an individual. But it, it depends on the personalization of that particular profile. So I, I think that's probably where we're going to be down the road. And do we do this already? Absolutely. What do we treat? Hypertension. What's hypertension? One number that we get from a cuff on the arm that gives you a couple of numbers to say your blood pressure is elevated. What's it due to? Combination therapy. It could be a water pill, a diuretic. It could be a heart blocker, and a beta blocker that's working on your heart. You could have a calcium channel antagonist. You could have an angiotensin receptor blocker. All different mechanisms that give you that one clinical symptom. Alzheimer's disease, dementia due to a variety of cognitive impairments. Uh, uh, variety of, of components, pathologic components, may be the answer. Bob, I'm going to give you the, the last word here. Um, one of the things that scientists tell me gives them optimism is that is they talk about better models, I mean, and partly better rodent models, but also people talk a lot about now about the use of mini brains and, you know, organoids. As a, as why, why are scientists optimistic about using that? You know, first of all, explain what it is, and, and why does that help you look at a disease like Alzheimer's and come up with a treatment for it? Well, what's, what's great about uh, these, these sort of uh, 3D brains in a dish, and, and uh, Rudy's lab has been the, one of the pioneers in this area, we can use human cells rather than uh, rodents you know, rodent, rodent, neuro, you know, rodent brains and rodent neurons have their limitations. But we, what we want to do is use the actual, actual human cells in, in the context of uh, a brain where we can actually do experiments. Of course, you know, it, it's, it's not very um, a great idea sometimes to do some of the experiments on people that we end up doing on mice or, uh, you know, uh, it would just be, you know... The review boards would, might the frown. Review, yeah, it, would, it wouldn't be a good thing. Uh, but, you know, I think if we, if we can develop something in culture with human neurons, which uh, we can do now with uh, uh, the, the stem cell technology that's, that's out there, and, uh, and create something in a dish, then we can start doing the types of experiments that would allow us to do 
for example, uh, high throughput screening of drugs on 3D brain cultures, and then see which ones are affecting amyloid pathology or tau pathology or neuroinflammation. That would give us a, a huge flexibility in terms of drug development. Um, the, the organoids, so there's, there are the, uh, the 3D cultures. Uh, organoids are a little bit different. Uh, what you can do is actually, um, under conditions, aggregate the, the, the human neurons together and, uh, and, and kind of stir them in a pot, and then they will grow and kind of, uh, in, in some cases, form a reasonably uh, structured type of uh, brain. The cells, the, the cells, cells do. grow they, together. They sort of self, they self assemble, and uh, you know you get layering similar to what you know, kind of what you get in a cortex. It's not by no means perfect, and there is a limitation in terms of how large these can get in the in the little pot that you grow them in. Uh, but but that's another approach that has a lot of uh, a lot of promise. We are just about out of time, but I'm going to ask you to do one more thing, each of the three of you. Answer this question. is When you go to your lab, when you're doing research, what is the one thing that gives you hope for success? Ron, I'll start with you. All right. Thanks for the easy one. I, I, I think, uh, I mean, I think that uh, what, what my, my colleagues in the laboratory, what, what this slide indicates with regard to imaging technology, biomarker technology, helps us to really define these diseases much more precisely, and that's going to lead to therapies down the road. So I think the people who are coming into the office and with these problems appreciate that and can contribute to that in a clinical sense. Bob. Well, what gives me hope is that there's, there's a, really a, a growing awareness of Alzheimer's disease uh, among the, uh, the general public and a real interest that, uh, that this is an important disease and that we really need more research, basic and clinical research uh, in, in this problem. And, and finally, the message has gotten through to the politicians and they've been you know, increasing funding uh, in, through the NIH. The Cure Alzheimer Fund has done an amazing job at, uh, at funding basic research for many years now. And, and it's, uh, you know, without, without help from both the Cure Alzheimer Fund and uh, also the NIH, I don't think we'd be where we were, are at. And, I, and I, I look to the future and getting more young people involved in the uh, research endeavor. I think we're going to learn a lot more about this disease. We're still not done yet. There's still a lot more to learn, uh, many more genes to identify and understand. And, uh, but I, I, we're getting closer. And I think some of the clinical trials, even the ones that have failed, like the anti-amyloid antibodies, um, I, think, I think there is hope there that we see some signals that, uh, that are positive and that we're moving forward. All right, Teresa? So um, I think there are two things that give me great hope. Um, and it normally happens on Tuesdays <laughs> because <laughs> clinic is my, um, um, I mean, m Monday is my clinic day. And um, one thing that gives me a lot of hope is to sit with my patients and, and, and feel that they understand that they are part of our research team. So bringing them on board, you know, uh, knowing that we are gonna fight together, um, just uh, seeing the uh, generosity of so many uh, patients and research subjects who are just committed to, you know, put their heads in any new machine you ask them to put their heads in, and or just, you know, undergoing lumbar taps or giving blood and, and and uh, knowing that you know it's hundreds of, of uh, people that you have in your research team, uh, that gives me hope. The other thing that gives me hope is when I go to my lab because um, and I see young students, uh, like uh, medical students, uh, graduate students, even high schoolers, you know, looking at an old problem with new eyes. That gives me a lot of hope because that challenges me to keep thinking outside the box. Uh, and, and, you know, um, I think we've had around the amyloid hypothesis since 1992, probably. And in my opinion, uh, we haven't either
convincingly prove or disprove um, whether you know amyloid is the cause of Alzheimer's disease. Um, but I think is you know we cannot abandon um, that hypothesis and just drop it. I think now for the first time we are going to be able um, to get the answer we've been looking for for you know over 20 years, which is if you intervene early with an anti-amyloid drug, is that going to really make a difference uh, for uh, the patients, yes or no? We need that answer. We desperately need that answer, in, and we will have uh, that answer. Um, but as I said, I think we don't want to put all the eggs in the amyloid basket. I think it's about to think, uh, it's about time to say, okay, as Ron was saying, you know, this is a complex disease. Concomitant pathologies are frequently present. Um, there is a lot of inter-individual variability. We really need to start thinking about the different stages of the disease. Some drugs may work at one stage, may not longer work at uh, another stage. And we need to start thinking about this, probably just like cancer. We will need uh, combined uh, therapies, I think, to, to um, um, tackle this disease. So, um, yeah, no, as I said, you know, I think it's great that we are now thinking about prevention, but I'm not quite ready to give up on, you know, my patients who already have a lot of symptoms. Uh, I'm also going to fight for them. I think we are all going to keep fighting for them. All right, thank you. And I will just add that uh, my own hope comes from the quality and the commitment of the scientists. I talk to about this every day. So thank you so much. Let's give them a hand. Thank you. Thank you all. And thank you, John, for helping us meet and understand these uh, true leaders in this uh, complex, difficult, often very frustrating battle. Uh, but I think the biggest hope is what you said, John, right at the end, that we can all share, is having met these people and their colleagues, which uh, some of whom we know, Rudy, Rudy's lab, the other 90 uh, researchers that we work with and people around the world, the biggest hope is that we have people like this who are not only professionally committed, but personally dedicated to the eradication of this disease. So thank you, thank you very much. We'd, uh, we'd love to uh, have you join us upstairs for a reception so that you can uh, talk one-on-one -on -one with the researchers, board members, staff members, and each other about what we've learned tonight and the hope going forward. Thank you very much.